Hanging on? Do you want to come over after school today? We just got a BCR, and I recorded Knight Rider last night. Whoa, that's awesome, Pete. It was on last night, but we can actually watch it today. Yep, and my mom's picking up Pac-Man for Atari on her way home. Unlimited free Pac-Man? So why don't we bike over to my house right after school? That sounds totally rad, but I don't think I can. How come? Okay, everyone, let's line up for recess. Remember, we're doing our multiplication facts time test as soon as we come back in, so you may want to use your recess time to brush up. So, why can't you come over to watch the show? I heard this episode has an evil version of Kit, and the cars get to fight each other. It's my dad. I still haven't passed my multiplication facts test, and he says I have to spend up all my time studying my facts until I do. Oh man, that's so lame. But hey, we get to take it again right after recess. Maybe you'll pass and be able to come over after all. I don't know. I get so scared whenever we take it because of that one minute time limit. It makes me so nervous I can't ever finish the test before time runs out. Yeah, that sucks. Have you asked Mrs. Morrison for help? Yeah, but she never really teaches us how to learn the facts. She just gave me some flashcards that she said will help me to memorize them. Well, that's not good. She should be helping you build a solid mathematical foundation so you can develop fluency and strong problem-solving skills. What does that mean? It means your teacher should teach you how to figure out the answers, not just make you memorize them. Wow, Pete, how do you know all of this? Well, I do have a PhD in math. What? You're only 11. In this dream you're having right now, I am. But in real life, I'm a grown-up with a math podcast. Just like you, remember? Oh, yeah. And you know what that means? What? It means I already passed this test, so I can come and watch Night Rider with you. Um, it also means you already saw that episode, like, 40 years ago. Good point. Hey there, Math Club. As you heard in our opening sketch, I had some difficulty learning my multiplication facts when I was in fifth grade. And even though that was about 40 years ago, there are still many kids who struggle with this today. That's right. And to talk about this challenge and to share her approach for addressing it, we've invited Dr. Julie Dixon to appear on the show today. And here she is now. Hi, Dr. Dixon. Thanks for joining us today. Hi there. Thanks for including me. Math Club, it's our pleasure to introduce Dr. Julie Dixon. Dr. Dixon is a professor of mathematics education at the University of Central Florida. She is an author of HMH's Into Math, Go Math, and Waggle School Mathematics series. As a leader of DNA Math, she authored Solution Trees, the Fact Tactics Fluency Program, building reasoning skills for multiplication in grades three through six, and co-authored the Making Sense of Mathematics for Teaching book and video series. In 2013, she published A Stroke of Luck, a girl's second chance at life with her daughter, Jessica Dixon. Especially important to Dr. Dixon is the need to support each and every student. Welcome to the Math Club, Dr. Dixon. Thanks so much. I'm really honored to be here. We are so happy to have you. And may I ask, how would you prefer that we address you during our conversation today? Please call me Julie. All right, Julie, before we jump into discussing your program, we'd love to hear about your background in math. Where did you start your math journey and what led you to a career in mathematics education? So I first found mathematics interesting as a young learner and to be completely truthful, I chose mathematics because my older sister didn't. People go into mathematics because they feel like they're so good at mathematics and it drew them to it. I was drawn to it because I found attention in it because my sister wasn't good at it. And I really enjoyed helping my peers. I ended up becoming a mathematics teacher and eventually a mathematics teacher educator at the university level. That's so interesting. So. You chose it first because your sister didn't, so there's a little rebel streak in you. I'm a loner, daddy. A rebel. And then you just sort of 
fell in love with it from there and began teaching it professionally. Exactly. I enjoy helping people to find the joy in mathematics and I enjoy helping people to experience success. I think that's cool. I really like that. You know, when I was teaching, I think that was probably my actual mission to help people find joy in mathematics. And when people do find that joy, they want to share it with others. And it all sort of gets paid forward, you know? I agree. I agree. And I, I loved my entire career focused on teaching mathematics and helping others to teach mathematics as well. What levels of mathematics did you teach early on in your career? Kindergarten through eighth grade, mostly. And then I taught high school in a hospital homebound setting. And I taught college algebra at Syracuse University as a graduate student before becoming a math teacher educator. That is so interesting that your teaching career has spanned from K-8 up through high school and then even into college algebra. I'm going to hazard a guess here that that's pretty unique for many teachers. You know, we often specialize. And yes, I taught a year of high school math a very long time ago. But the, the majority of my career as an educator has been with college students. So I think you've got a very interesting vantage point having spanned so many years of the curriculum. Thank you. And I'm just curious, I know that these days you're doing professional development and you're authoring books on, on mathematical topics. Are you still in the classroom at all? So I'm a professor at the University of Central Florida, helping to prepare mathematics teachers and supporting master's and doctoral students to do the same. In that capacity and through my professional development, I still model teach in teachers' classrooms quite regularly. That's really cool. And speaking of things that are cool, I have to tell you, Julie, that I love the term fact tactics. That was very catchy to me right from the get-go. How did you come up with the term fact tactics? I think that's a, such a charming little term. And how did you get started thinking about putting together a program around this core idea? Fact tactics developed out of necessity, and I'll explain that in a moment. But the title came from my efforts to become more strategic in how we bring students to fluency. Because what we've been doing in the past just isn't working. Now, what specifically brought me to this program is a personal experience. My older daughter, Alex, had a stroke when she was 12. And following that stroke, she had to relearn all of her academics. And so I had a child who had already been fluent, need to become fluent again. And as I supported her to relearn everything, I had this window into a fast forward experience of developing procedural fluency. And what I found with Alex is that memory wasn't enough. She needed to have strategies. And because she had so much to relearn, I needed to be strategic with how I presented those strategies to her. That's where we come into the fact tactics. I was tactical. And so if I could help her to learn her basic facts using strategies that would help her in later mathematics, I was sort of double dipping on the time I spent with her developing fluency. And so it's from that experience that I started conceptualizing the Fact Tactics Fluency Program. That's really interesting to me. And I also didn't realize it until you just told us that story that there's a little bit of wordplay in your title, A Stroke of Luck, A Girl's Second Chance at Life. You have two daughters because you wrote that book with your daughter, Jessica. Two daughters. My younger daughter, Jessica, and I wrote the book about Alex to describe her journey. We first wrote it so that she would know her journey, resulting in her stroke and following her stroke, and then to help others who find themselves in similar situations. Julie, I think that's an amazing story. It's obviously very touching as a parent myself of two kids. I can imagine the kind of care and the intensity of that experience and the way it must have pulled at your heart and your whole being. And then to be able to turn that into something to help Alex. But then this secondary idea that, you know, this could help lots of people. 
I think there's something about that that I admire so much. So first of all, thank you for sharing it with us here. And more broadly, thank you for sharing it with all of us who are interested in teaching and developing the kind of strategies that can help all people learn. Thank you. And so that we have a more current perspective, Alex now has graduated from college and is a preschool paraprofessional supporting children, including children with special needs, to learn and develop. And so these strategies that I developed and used with Alex have served her well in the long term. I have a question about those strategies. How do the strategies that you provide in your fact tactics program differ from the more traditional strategies that teachers may be used to using, like, for example, skip counting or flashcards or things like that? So skip counting helps to develop memorization, right? Skip counting, you can think of as sort of a chant that we memorize. We learn through this rote process. Like two, four, six, eight, who do we appreciate, right? It becomes a like almost a musical thing that you plug into, which makes you wonder, well, is there really math there? <laughs> I mean, there is, but it's become rote, right? It's an artifact of memorization. Exactly. And the use of flashcards also results in this artifact of memorization. And so they work for this one thing to remember. But when we look at strategies for basic facts, strategies that are based on properties of operations, like the associative property of multiplication or the distributive property of multiplication over addition, now we're using processes that will serve us later, even in algebra. So the time we spend learning our basic facts isn't just for our basic facts. It helps us later in mathematics to come. Additionally, when students are maybe under stress, they're less likely to be able to recall, right? When there's anxiety in place as well. But when we use strategies, we have more than one way to get to an answer because we have these different pathways we can use. I'd like to jump in with a personal anecdote that you just reminded me of. You mentioned the stress or the anxiety that kids can feel about their facts. And even though our opening sketch today was a bit of a dramatization with some license taken, it was very much based on an experience that I really had when I was in fifth grade. I was the very last kid in my fifth grade class to pass what was called the level one multiplication facts test. And I remember the first time we took it, the whole class took this test. We had a minute to pass it. I don't remember specifically, but I'm guessing it was a test on our twos because that's probably the first one most teachers give. And about half the class passed it and half of us didn't. And then the next day we took it again. The kids that passed it moved on to the level two test. The kids that didn't took level one again. And then at that point, about half of the remaining kids passed it. I still was not in that group. And several days went by and we kept taking this test. And eventually I was the only kid in my class taking the level one test. And just that fact alone made it almost impossible for me to ever pass the test because I was so anxious. I was so, well, frankly, embarrassed even that I was sitting here having to take this thing and I was the only one still taking it. How embarrassing. How embarrassing. So I really can relate to what you're saying about kids suffering from stress and anxiety around this sort of thing. And it's not only the students who are struggling, it's students who don't struggle, who can still develop that same anxiety from those time tests. It can be avoided. Well, can you tell us a little bit about how the strategies in your program are different and help students to avoid that stress? Sure. So the time test we'll get to in a moment, but prior to that, when students explore different strategies, I use six times seven frequently as an example, because I think it has so many strategies and it's a fact with which students often struggle. You can think of six times seven as five times seven and then add another seven because you know your five's facts. Now you have a strategy to get to six times seven based on something you know. You might also know three times seven is 21 and you can double 21 in your head to get 42. Now you have a second strategy you can use. When there's stress, 
you're less likely to be able to remember the product. But now we have these two additional ways to get to the product if you don't remember it right away. And so that can lower your anxiety. But time tests often increase anxiety. So even as we're learning our basic facts, we can assess students where they are without time tests, but rather ask them, do you know this fact without thinking? Or is there a strategy you can use to get to that fact? If so, what is it? So that again, we're acknowledging to students, you don't just have to memorize everything as long as you have an efficient way to get there. This makes so much sense to me. And I think there are opportunities here for high school and college teachers as well. For example, trig students often feel overwhelmed by the number of identities that they have to learn. Well, if you take the identity sine squared plus cosine squared equals one and divide both sides by cosine squared, you get tangent squared plus one equals secant squared. You can derive that second identity from the first one. So this really is a fact tactic. And this kind of thinking can be applied all across the high school math curriculum. Exactly. And it really is what a lot of mathematics is about, deriving what you need from what you know. Both examples, that's what we're doing. Oh, I love how crisply you stated that. We derive what we need from what we know. That's beautiful. I really love that too. And Julie, I have two different words that are popping into my head right now. And I would love to hear your take on the difference between the idea of fluency as opposed to the idea of automaticity. Sure. So when we think of automaticity, we think of just knowing without thinking, right? I automatically knew this. When we think about fluency, though, we're looking for what can we do flexibly, accurately, efficiently, and appropriately. The National Research Council is adding it up, written way back in 2001, describes that as procedural fluency. And that's really what we're talking about with our basic facts. Are we flexible in how we come up with the product of the fact? Are we accurate getting the right answer? Is it efficient? And are we using this strategy appropriately? It's interesting that we think that just knowing must be the best, but it isn't always. Because if we can derive some other facts that we know, we have the opportunity to practice the applications of these properties of operations. My younger daughter, Jessica, the co-author of that book that we talked about earlier, she's now 23, still to this day, she thinks of six times seven as two times seven and triple. She can do it quickly and it's not holding her back. She's getting her PhD in neuroscience at Harvard still thinking of six times seven as two times seven and triple. So fluency is enough if it's truly fluency we're talking about. Yes. And somehow we latched onto this idea that automaticity, this automatic recall was the hallmark or the pinnacle of learning. Like you shut your brain off because all you need to do is just like spit out the automatic fact that gets served to your mouth. And like, that's not really thinking. That's not really what we talk about when we think about critical reasoning and logic and all of the things that we value as human beings about having a brain and a mind, right? The automatic part, well, that's like chat GPT, like some kind of robot that just spits out these detached, isolated, memorized facts. The first 1000 digits of pi are three. One, four, one, five, nine, but two. But what six, I value in myself is this ability to say, well, I, I don't know automatically. Let me think about it. And it's that ability to engage with the thought process, with the thinking aspect of your mind, that is what we should be driving at. Yeah, exactly, Pete. And I think that is precisely what was causing my stress and anxiety back in fifth grade. I wish that the most important goal back then wasn't just passing this test in one minute. But to be clear, this wasn't a case of a bad teacher or anything like that. This was just the way math facts fluency was taught back in the early 80s. I mean, 
even a decade and a half later, when I started teaching fifth grade in the mid nineties, this was still how we did it. I gave my students the same type of timed facts tests, but there's a lot more research now. And you know what they say, when you know better, you do better. I just wish the goal back when I was in school was making sure that we knew enough about math and strategies and tactics to figure out the answers. That's what's really important, not just learning them to the point where you can spit them out without thinking. Absolutely. So Julie, let's suppose that someone has gotten a hold of your new book, then they're very interested in fact tactics fluency. And now I'm thinking about maybe this is somebody in a home setting. Maybe this is somebody who is teaching in the classroom. How can folks use fact tactics, say in a school or in a home setting? Great question. So in a school, the more people you can get involved, the better. So that in a school setting, first, you'd make sure that students have made sense of multiplication. They need to have something to derive their facts from. So they need to understand what multiplication is. There's a few facts they need to know. Those are the twos facts, the five facts, and three times three. And then they follow this 20 week program. At the start of each week, each teacher in third grade or third and fourth grade, whichever grade students need the attention to their fact fluency, will introduce the fact for the week. And these 20 facts are provided in order in the fact tactics fluency program. The teacher presents the fact using a web. So we've already talked about six times seven. Say six times seven is the fact for that week, and it's part of the fact seven times six. Students offer strategies based on multiplicative reasoning. So strategies that aren't by counting or repeated addition, rather strategies that use other facts the students already know. The students share those strategies. The teacher records them on the board or document camera. And once they're recorded, Each student chooses the strategy they like best. They have a card. On one side of the card is the fact. And on the other side of the card, they record their strategy and the product of the fact. The students keep the cards with them. They can wear them on a lanyard. They can clip them on their clothing. And any adult in the building would say, hey, what's your strategy? Because everybody's working on the same fact that week. So anytime an adult sees the students, they can see what's your strategy, what's your strategy, and what's the product. And so for that week, the students are repeating their strategy, talking about the math, and practicing the product of the fact for the week. I really love the sense of community that this brings to working on facts and learning how to figure out the answers to these facts. It reminds me of when I was in the classroom before I became a teacher on special assignment, At some schools, they say, those are your kids and these are my kids. But at our school, we always said, all of these kids are our kids. And every adult on campus took responsibility for every student on campus. And it really sounds like what you're describing goes hand in hand with that kind of an approach and philosophy to teaching and learning. Absolutely. And a school that used this program found that sense of community with their students. They even had to make sure that the students were not taking the lanyards home with them. They had to have a neck check every day to make sure the students would leave the cards at school. But you also asked about home. A teacher, a colleague of mine, used this with her child who was entering third grade. So first, she's a math teacher. She helped her child make sense of multiplication before beginning the program. And then she introduced a new fact in order with her child. Now she does this home school each summer with her child and her child doesn't always want to do everything that this teacher provides. But with fact tactics, her child was asking, when's the next fact? When's the next fact? So it became a family experience that was positive for the student. You know, just, I want to, echo what Noah said about the community aspect of this. I really love that. Getting so many people simultaneously involved in this adventure. That's really cool. I was also thinking, how cool is it 
to be wearing your mathematics, right? So you've either got a lanyard or you've got it clipped to your shirt and you're wearing your math and it goes with you. I think that is so awesome. And that last thing you said, Julie, the when is the next fact, that reminds me a little bit of gamification, which I know, especially because of software development, is gaining some currency in the world of education where there are these little incentives that are built into the learning process and getting your hands on the next fact, like, oh, you're leveling up. You get to put a new card on your lanyard. Like there's something tangible and real about that. So it kind of brings the math a little bit more to life. And everybody gets to get to the next fact. It's not just the people that pass level one or level two. We all proceed together. Oh, thank goodness. Julie, circling back to something you said just a few minutes ago, you said that when starting the program, it's beneficial if students come in already knowing their twos, their fives, and three times three. What do you suggest for students who are struggling just to learn those basic facts? That's a another good question. For students who are struggling to learn their doubles and their fives, it is okay to practice the chants, the counting by twos, the counting by fives, the recording them. Because what we're looking at is a program that used derived facts. So there needs to be facts that students already know. What I've selected in this program are facts that students typically learn first. Because we do so much skip counting from early grades, students get to third grade and many students can already count by twos and count by fives. So I would use any techniques that involve memorization, but not timed tests to help students to get there. And if they don't know them, then make a little chart with the multiples of two and the multiples of five that students keep with them so they can rely on that. You could also do the same thing with three times three. And then through the repetition of the program, because students are going to derive new facts from those facts, students are more likely to remember because of all the practice. But there's fewer facts to memorize. Did either of you ever use music or song to help you memorize those basic facts? Actually, I was just thinking of mentioning how helpful Schoolhouse Rock was for me growing up and singing those twos and those fives and all those other multiplication rock songs that we all saw on Saturday mornings growing up. Elementary, my dear, two times two is four. Elementary, my dear, two times three is six. Elementary. Yeah, those are great. I love those. And a few months ago, I was walking my first grader to school and taught him the multiples of five by singing Yankee Doodle because that's how I grew up learning it. You know, five times five is 25 and five times six is 30. And you keep going for the whole Yankee Doodle song. But, you know, I think... What you're saying here, Julie, reminds me of what we do in every level of mathematics, which is you start from a set of axioms and from the axioms, which you take as your givens, you derive, well, the whole of mathematics, actually, if you start from your foundational axiom set. But in multiplication, yes, you could say with very advanced college students, you could even derive the facts for the twos and the fives and the three by three and so forth. But having that as a foundation, as soon as I read that this is your preferred starting point, I thought, oh, I can see exactly why, because you don't have to do three times two because you've already done it as part of your twos, right? Two times three. You won't have done three times three yet. So you need that fact. But what about three times four? And then I thought, oh, well, that's two times three and then times two again. So you're deriving it from what you know about twos. And I love this idea of saying, we've got a foundation that we're going to start from. And I can imagine in addition to skip counting and singing songs, you could also work with manipulatives. I always get out like coins and make little square and rectangular arrays of pennies to think about like, what is two times six? Well, you can make two rows of six pennies. And I'm sure all of the elementary school teachers who are listening right now must have dozens of recommendations for really good manipulatives to help bring this stuff to life. But I think if you know your twos, your fives, and just that one fact, three times three, you've really got a lot to work with. You do. 
And what's nice is you have only 20 more facts and their partner facts with the commutative property for multiplication to learn. Just 20. We can do this. Yeah, it suddenly sounds so manageable when you put it that way. It doesn't sound daunting at all. Something that sounded very daunting and difficult to me when I was 11 sounds much more manageable and friendly even when I hear you describe the way that it works with your program. And I'm glad that we had a discussion about manipulatives because this doesn't replace manipulatives. It extends and makes that experience more efficient. I still want students to have had the opportunity to use manipulatives to make groups of objects, to organize manipulatives into arrays to make sense of rows with the same number of objects in each row. Eventually, we want to be more efficient. And that's where we get to deriving the facts from other facts that we know. Yeah. And Noah, you're right. The expression partner fact really is friendly, right? It's like, oh, that's my partner fact. That's my friend. I love it. Yeah, I also want to just take a second to say, me. I can tell this is already a great episode. Anytime we get the associative, commutative, and distributive properties all in one show, you know it's pretty awesome. Okay, so Julie, can I ask a question that's kind of a, well, a partner question to what Noah just asked? How can fact tactics provide challenges for those students who have already maybe mastered most or all of their basic facts? What do you do with that group of students? I'm glad you asked that because the fact tactics fluency does lead to fluency with basic facts, but it does much more than that. We need to find ways to challenge our students who already know their facts while helping them to make sense of all of the properties that we just discussed. We do that by looking at extension tasks. The first week of the program, students explore three times four. But say students in the class already know three times four, they don't have the motivation to use strategies based on properties of operations to find the product of 12. But we still want those students to have a challenge and to explore the properties of operations. So the extension task for week one is finding the product of two times 34. Not a basic fact, but a multiplication problem that is connected to three times four because students can use similar strategies that others would use to find the product of three times four to find the more difficult product of two times 34. They can break apart 34 into 30 plus four and use the distributive property of multiplication over addition. They could find two times 35 and subtract two times one by using the distributive property of multiplication over subtraction. So they're practicing the properties that we need for later success in algebra and still experiencing challenge like students who are learning their basic facts. That's great. Yeah. And, and I think that, first of all, I love that there's a way to keep students engaged if they already have an automatic command, say, of three times four. You don't simply say, well, I, I, okay, I guess you get it. You say, all right, well, then let's ramp this up to a place where you don't already have an automatic recall and challenge you to apply the strategy in that more difficult setting. And that ability will translate exceedingly well across all of the grade levels. And I would say even into college and beyond. It's productive perseverance that we're developing based in the use of properties of operations for mathematics. And I worry that our students who don't struggle in mathematics don't have the opportunity to develop that productive perseverance as young learners. I love that term, productive perseverance. I don't think I've ever heard it before, but it's immediately obvious exactly what you mean by that and how it applies here in this setting and actually across the curriculum in all of education. Julie, I have one more question for you. We've spent a lot of time today in this conversation talking about student learning and how students work with the program. But now I'm curious from a teacher's point of view, what sort of professional development is available for teachers who might want to start using your program? What type of professional development would be helpful for teachers as they start out using the Fact Tactics Fluency program? First, I encourage people to get the book and read it. 
if they feel that they want more support with it, and some teachers and schools and districts do, then there are webinars available to support virtually. There are face-to-face -face workshops available. I come and work with districts. There's so much support for teachers to feel comfortable with the program, but I think it starts with the book. So if teachers want to read your book, where can they find it? And where can they find you if they want to reach out to you to have some kind of a dialogue? The book is available at Solution Tree, and I also offer professional development through Solution Tree. If you want to reach out to me directly, you can do so through dnamath.com. Great. And Math Club will be putting links to the book on Solution Tree as well as to dnamath.com in our show notes. Well, Julie, thank you for being here for this most spectacular episode. I think it's going to be one of our best. So many interesting and helpful things going on in this program that you've developed. So on behalf of everyone in the math club, I would like to say thank you. I really appreciate your time. Yes, Julie, I'd also like to say thank you so much for being here with us. It was incredibly enlightening. I actually got a chance to start reading your book and my wife who teaches third grade has already claimed it as her own and it is now her book. <laughs> so she <laughs> is definitely going to be taking a look and using your fact tactics with her class that she has this year. That's the best compliment ever. I appreciate your spending time with me and this program. Thank you. Wow, P, what a fantastic interview that was. I am so glad that we were able to get Julie on the show to talk about her program. Also, before we go, we would like to thank Batsheva Frankel for appearing in our opening sketch as Mrs. Morrison, my old fifth grade teacher. Now, Pete, before we sign off, would you like to tell people how they can reach out to us if they have questions or want to suggest topics for future episodes? I sure would. Math Club, we would love to hear from you. And in particular, we'd love to hear your voice. Leave us a voice message at our SpeakPipe page, speakpipe.com slash mathclubpodcast. You can also reach us at Twitter, which I guess is called X now. Our handle is still at Math Club Podcast. And finally, you can send us an email. Our address is mathclubpodcast at gmail.com. Hey, Pete, you may need to just start doing some rummaging around for your old VCR because I am on my way over to watch some Night Rider with you. Roger that, Noah. Why don't you turbo boost your way over to my house? All right, will do. See you next time, Math Club. Bye, Matt Cloud.